From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hey everyone, I'm Daniel Schweiker, and welcome to Film Music Live, the show where you get to ask the questions to today's top composers. I'm happy to have you here. When he stabbed his way into Hollywood's top rank of genre-centric composers with the very first scream, Jerry Goldsmith's protege, Marco Beltrami, wasn't exactly playing horror, but rather somewhere in the middle between slasher satire and blood-curdling symphonic terror. Sure, Beltrami has been out of Ghostface's mask in the near 150 scores he's done since Wes Craven's 1996 smash with such scores as 54, The First 20 Million is Always the Hardest, Mesrin, and Soul Surfer, notching up two Oscar nominations for 310 to Yuma and his co-score with Buck Sanders for The Hurt Locker. But it's always horror that keeps pulling Beltrami back in with a boisterous symphonic sound that makes him a scary natural with a bitingly funny edge in such scores as Hellboy, Cursed, Little Evil, Velvet Buzzsaw, and Fear Street. But for a composer who's given the OG count his due in Dracula 2000, not to mention giving actor Nicholas Holt no amount of undead grief and warm bodies, there's no soundtrack for Beltrami to go wonderfully wild with the fiendishly hilarious delight of Renfield. At last, Drac's hapless familiar gets his due with Holt in the role of an American transplanted lackey who's had it up to here with the cage's malicious count. Beltrami lets loose like never before in this particular genre spin with a hilariously and scarily imaginative score. Bringing in a crypt full of Dracula musical tropes from organ to woeful violin, a raging gothic orchestra, and Latin chorus, Beltrami drinks in the extra hip blood of bluesy funk, alt rhythm, and rock guitar, all with an emotional heart for a hapless flunky determined to get his soul back through a self-empowerment group and an unlikely cop romance, all to be his own man without procuring fresh human meat. It's a particularly delightful effort from a composer who certainly knows how to play horror with a straight face, but is never more fun than when revealing a snarling smile. And now here's a composer who's no lackey when it comes to taking a scary fun bite out of horror. Marco Beltrami, welcome to Film Music Live. Hey, Dan. Well, it's, good, it's uh, great to have you here again. Good to see you. It's been a while since I've seen you. It's, uh, it's, it's fun to to see you again. Absolutely. You know, and it's fun, you know, when you when you think about it, is kind of the score that, you know, was really your big splash in Hollywood was Scream. And what happens in Renfield, it almost kind of goes back to your ability to juggle these two emotional extremes between horror and comedy and both things at once. Did that hit you when you were doing uh, Renfield? I mean, uh, yeah, the thing with uh, Scream, although they're, they are uh, humorous movies, I, I mean, I always played them straight. And um, I think that's the same thing here. Like, uh, by being genuine to the to the horror stuff on it that, you know, it's not like you're trying to be funny. I, uh, you know, I, I've tried to do one comedy movie um, that failed miserably, but um, the, uh, uh, I think the thing that makes it fun is the, you know, the, the, the film itself and playing, playing it straight. I think Louis Virginelli has a really great question that can launch off where I'm going. Um, now, this is the second Dracula movie you have scored. Uh, while both polar opposites and both great scores in their own right, do you feel the need to pay homage to the universal classic monsters Dracula movies of the past? And what are the, some of the key ingredients that are needed in scoring Renfield? Well, I mean, the um, so that whole opening black and white sequence at the beginning of this movie, um, you know, I was thinking it'd be really fun uh, at first, when I first came on to pay homage to the, um, you know, the the original 
Swan Lake score that was used in the um, the, the, the first Dracula movie. Um, uh, it it didn't really. I, I think it, it it made everybody a little bit nervous to to go that that route. Um, so I mean, there's only one place that I was able to give it a reference, but it, you know, you wouldn't know that it, it was from Swan Lake. And, and uh, there's one scene in in the um, uh, where is it after Dracula goes into the Coda meeting and kills everybody, um, but. You know, I it, yeah, it, it would have been it would have been fun to do a little bit more of um, uh, of that, but you know, I it's it, it it wanted to be a modern score as well, so uh, we had to be very judicious about that. Yeah, you could say the opening of Renfield just literally had me at hello. I mean, I knew I was going to love this movie. I mean, it's, it's one of the coolest things I've seen since Zelig. And there's a really great article about how they kind of had a fight for that opening. Um, yeah, I mean, and, um, I, you know, all in all, I think the choice that they made, which was to go with sort of instead of playing, instead of playing like old Dracula, since because it was originally cut, differently it didn't start with the you know the coda meeting but once they did that it was like all right yeah this is a movie it's not about Dracula it's about Renfield so we want the music to reflect sort of this down and out Renfield character instead and that was the became the focus of the scene rather than so you're playing that against the footage of the of the old black and white um field right um you know, and, and right right from the beginning, you have this kind of this blues, funky, sad sack sound, which is pretty much the last thing you would expect to hear in anything involving a vampire. And it just kind of gives you a clue as to how diverse uh, the score was going to be. Yeah, that's exactly what I was just mentioning, that, that music right there. Um, and um, I think it actually makes it more funny in a way, even though... You know, there's nothing funny about the music. It's just uh, the way it's used in, in juxtaposition with what the images that you see. Um, I think that's what what gives it some some humor. Yeah. How, how do you see Renfield? I mean, what how, how did this Renfield come across to you in uh, Nichol, Nichols Holt's performance? Oh, he's amazing. I mean, the way he's able to achieve so many different emotional states, uh, He's always been, I've always been a huge fan of his, even back from when we did Warm Bodies. Um, uh, and yeah, so, um, he, you know, he has a big character arc in this movie going from the, the down and out, um, you know, pressed character to finding his freedom. So um, he has a theme, which you hear there in that first cue that, that sort of bluesy thing which evolves through the the movie um and um you know, it's able to open up yeah I mean, obviously you know i did learn the notes for dracula 2000 uh way way back which was your your, yeah. your dracula movie before this uh yeah and there's some of the same kind of ideas show up in this too i mean what what does dracula mean to you musically what oh what what are the ideas that show up? What are the I'm curious. Well, I think you know a, a core course. I think you know organ or just this kind of this this majesty uh, oh. about the character that you definitely hear. That, that's definitely well, Dracula. You know, I mean, it's it's you have to acknowledge that. I think um, through at least some sort of tradition. So um, so yeah, I mean, organ seems to be a fun fun instrument for. Dracula. Um, that had a very different feel. That I, I remember Dracula 2000. That you know that had a whole history of Dracula going back to being Judas. You know the time of Jesus, and so having a it had a little bit of a Middle Eastern um, flair to it in the score. Um, in fact, I had a, a singer. Shoot, what was her name? Um, uh, but yeah, she was um, she was Persian, and um, uh, she gave it a lot of the character that, that we had in that. So, um, and and you know, it was um, 
I guess, a more serious tone to it. Now, how, you know, Nicolas Cage just really gives it his all, and he's just terrific in the film. But what, just as a viewer, what does Nicolas Cage mean to you? I mean, you know, I mean, you scored, you know, for me, one of my favorite scores you've ever done, and probably one of the best films I've ever seen is Knowing, which is a way, way, way more serious uh, film and, and score than this. But what does just Nicolas Cage as an actor, you know, connote to you in just seeing, you know, his performances? Um, I mean, he's he's really fun actor. Uh, even in even in the knowing, I mean, there was some some fun moments when we were scoring. You know, when you're watching the movie over and over again, you just pick up on little idiosyncrasies of the actors. And um, and there were some fun moments in the knowing. Uh, but I I think you know he one of the fun things about him is that he's not afraid to go a little bit. Um, ride the line of being a little bit quirky and sometimes a little over the top, but not not in a bad way, but like, um, um, you know, pushing the envelope of the character. Uh, and, and he certainly does that in Renfield, which makes it that much more fun of a ride. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm fortunate that I got to, the two movies that he was in. Right, right. And then you have a pretty distinctive Dracula theme as well in the score. Yeah. But tell, tell us how you arrived at that one. Um, well, the place where it's most evident is when Dracula, it's like a slow motion scene of him coming into the Coda meeting. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, so it was a big question like how dark do you want to play him how um serious and my instinct was to go a little bit heavier um in that area which is what you know that scene reflects um and i think the way they ended up cutting it and, and it all worked in slow motion it, it gave license to be a little bit uh bigger there so um uh yeah it's just responding to what i saw visually it's now i've got another question from ivan sorkin uh obviously you've got swan lake in this but you've done other really great kind of franchise scores like terminator 3 or the omen and ivan would love to know you've worked with thematic material by goldsmith morcone carpenter Kamen, fidel was is it difficult for you to work with existing material while composing your own themes for those films or those scores yeah i mean in um all those movies, uh, or I think the ones that, that he's referring to, um, you know, The Omen and uh, which Jerry Goldsmith originally scored and the Die Hard movies with, that Michael Kamen originally scored and um, um, The Thing um, that any more Coney scored. Um, yeah, there were, there were strong uh, motivic, not always thematic but motivic elements that um, the studio definitely told me not to copy. They wanted new scores in all these cases, but yet I thought I have to do some sort of pay respect <laughs> to, to the scores. Uh, so, you know, in the Die Hard thing, it's a very simple motive that Michael came and used. Um, you know, dun, 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 dun. Um, and so we were able to integrate it in a way that was um, you know, it didn't sound like we were doing an old-fashioned score. We could integrate it as a just a motivic thing in what we were doing. Um, and similarly with uh, the thing, we were able to incorporate, you know, sort of the essence, the idea of uh, the original thing so that if here you'd be like, oh, yeah, I, I can hear where it's coming from, but it's not a direct ripoff or copy. Um, in on, Honestly, in the, the Omen, the thing that's amazing about that score is 
you can really reduce what Jerry did, the whole score. It's like you can reduce it down to like three notes. And um, all the material that he gets from it comes from this basic um, note pattern. Um, and so I thought the best way to pay homage to Jerry would be to, you know, try to be able to reduce my score down to as few notes as possible. Um, I wasn't quite able to make it to three notes, but um, uh, it was more a, a stylistic uh, and identity thing since the film was pretty much um, very close shot for shot to the, the original Omen. So, yeah. That's a really effective, you know, new take on it. And going back to Renfield, the thing that strikes me about Dracula, he has his little moments of seduction in it, but he's a pretty vicious a-hole. <laughs> he's abusive, you know. I, I'm sure you probably had your own stories about having passive-aggressive stuff going on creatively with, like, execs or, or whatnot. But how did that kind of, that nastiness of Dracula here play into the score? I mean, it's, these are the things as a composer that you respond to, the way the, uh, the characters are perceived um, and the way you want to accent different elements of their personality and, and all. But um, yeah, like for instance, in Dracula's lair in that abandoned hospital there, um, you know, he can be at once charming and uh, endearing to Nicholas Holt and the music uh, supports that. It, it sort of reinforces what he's doing, but then it also changes on a dime and can get very ugly and, um, and dark and menacing. So, uh, so, you know, I, in, in, in those circumstances, I wasn't really playing against what the picture was doing, like the opening was, but more um, supporting what was happening uh, in the scene. Yeah, and you know another fun element of the of the movie is the the gangster element, which kind of throws me back to another vampire comedy I really love called Innocent Blood. Uh, and this, you know, it's uh, teaming up with drug dealers to take over the world. How how did you want to kind of capture that kind of modern gangster club element and throw it into a Dracula score? Um, yeah, I mean, just channeling sort of what my idea of a, um, you know, that, what something they could, people would watch it, they'd feel like, oh, it has a little bit of a, you know, old gangster sound to it, um, but without being too specific. So, uh, I don't know. It's just sort of what, I guess, uh, you go with what, what inspiration you find inside. Now we're going to go to another uh, cool horse score you did. Uh, here's a question from Jake Wright. Uh, he loved your score for World War Z. What was it like working with Brad Pitt on that film? Uh, it was great. I, uh, he came out to the studio a couple times and uh, played him ideas. He, uh, he had originally, because that was, that was a complicated movie, actually, because there was you know, a director that got let go on it. Um, this studio had the editor working on it. And, uh, so in terms of direction, um, Brad, I remember had some musical ideas, uh, things that, uh, or not, not ideas, but references, some pieces of music that he liked. Um, not to picture or anything, but just things that were, inspiring to him and the feel for the, for the movie. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the jobs of the composer is to internalize that and see how does that, how does that impact the big picture of the score and what, what can you do to uh, integrate these ideas um, without, you know, without disrupting the, too much the, the flow of the score. So um, 
uh, yeah, and then then he would come back and review some cues and seemed really supportive and uh, very happy. So it it was uh, it was uh, it was great. You know, you keep hearing about like I, I think they remade the whole second half of the of the film. Uh, was that a challenge to essentially kind of almost score like a whole other film uh, when that when we that did was score two challenge? films? We did score two. Uh, we had so. Yeah, I mean, the um, it, it was a big it was a big tentpole movie, and the studio wanted a big uh, epic score to it. Um, one of the things that some of the producers wanted was a more intimate, um, gritty score, uh, and then we also had new footage that was coming in. So. Uh, actually wrote two scores for this film and recorded two scores. We did one uh, over at, at Abbey Road um, with a big orchestra and then had another over at um, another studio in London, um, which uh, I forget the name of Mark Knopfler's studio. Um, and that was a much smaller group, uh, more intimate score. And we scored the same same scenes, uh, the whole movie. And uh, they finally put it together on at the mix and they could, you know, use different elements from whatever they wanted. Uh, it was constructed in such a way that, um, you know, the tempos were the same for both scores. Um, and uh, key wise, the cues were the same key. So you could interchange, you could go from one to the other pretty seamlessly. Uh, so if there were times where it needed to be more gritty, it could be, if it needed to be, um, a little more expansive, it could be. Now in Renfield, again, I just, I just love the whole scene with the knife, the, the knife throwing assassin and the whole, because essentially also you're scoring a superhero movie. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Um, so, yeah, so that, that scene, they, um, uh, so the first part of that scene when Renfield goes in and meets the drug dealers, they used, um, you know, Bizet's Carmen uh, as, um, you know, it's like, it works like as a needle drop for that scene plays through that. Um, we tried to do a version uh, you know, to use that same Carmen theme, but to do it with, um, you know, electric guitars and, and uh, synthetically and, um, you know, electronically. Um, but it ended up being sounding a little bit too comedic. So that piece exists. You can hear it actually in the end credits. They put it in the end credits. Uh, but... Um, uh, the knife wielding thing, it became a little bit more of an orchestral cue with, with, you know, with electronics too. But, um, uh, but yeah, I guess, you know, a little bit more, like you said. Now we've got a question from Veronique in uh, Paris. Uh, you've composed with great talent for many different genres of films. Is there one in particular that you would still like to tackle? And if so, which one? Um, Hi, Veronique. Um, I, um, at this point, I, I, I wouldn't really say genre is the thing that, that um, affects me so much as just the individual movie. So, um, I mean, I love, look, I, I love doing Westerns and I, I still think that um, every score I do is a Western. But um, uh, so that, that's something I, even though I've done some, I, I always like to do more. Uh, but other than that, I, it's really dependent on the film and how I'm inspired and how it makes me feel. And, and that's, I think, a very individual thing. It's when I see the movie, I, I know if I respond to it and if I can do something for it. Um, and it's, it's not dependent on genre. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, now one of my favorite pieces I had this is this is a really good question because I was kind of like, what is this music from? Because it's so different from the rest of the Renfield album, but it's terrific. It's the last cue. And uh CDT Cobra it talks about the last track on the Renfield album, Dracula's Gone, is an impressive orchestral orchestral cue of a kind of we don't hear much in the movies anymore. What made you go this route on this particular piece? Um yeah, so I was um, playing around a little bit with early on, you know, the music for Dracula. How far could I uh, take it in, in pushing the envelope a little bit orchestrally? Uh, and it, it never really found its place in the movie. But I, I wanted to experiment a little bit and. Uh, and finish the piece uh, since I started on it. Um, there's elements in it that are that ended up being part of Dracula's theme uh, in it, but in a much more you know conventional way in, in the film. But um, this is a little bit more uh, of a tonally challenged piece. So uh, yeah, I mean it was it, I, we put it on because it was fun and we recorded it. And, um, but it's not it's not in the movie. And the other thing I noticed in the, the really great little end credit seat, there's a dance number uh, that was originally in there, I guess. There was. I mean, it was that was one of the hard things about this movie is that the tone and that's what is, uh, you know, I think sometimes in the struggle, that's how you find something that's original, because um, the tone on this was really mixed early on. And it's like, what is this movie? And it, it didn't really know what it wanted to be. It had to find its way. And it was a lot of, a lot of um, trial and error and seeing. And, and yeah, there was, a, there was a, like a musical number in it after, right after um, the scene in the diner where, where um, you know, Teddy and the Lobos come in, and and um, and and Renfield fights. Renfield and Aquafina fight together, and they have their moment. And then he's like so happy, and then he goes like he leaves the restaurant. He he does this musical number with on the street. It's like a couple minute long thing, and it was like this is really fun on its own to watch. But I think the feeling was this totally changes the feel of the movie too much. You know, it was it, it like, it like pulled it to one direction too much and it, it made it a little bit confusing. So um, they eventually cut it out, but it's such a great scene. Um, and to watch Nicholas Holt do, you know, do like a song and dance thing, it's amazing. Uh, so, you know, they kept a little bit in the end credits. Yeah, no, I, well, I'm sure that's all going to be on the uh, Blu-ray. Now, here's a really interesting question from uh, Thomas Cassie. Um, Having done lots of horror and sci-fi, any thoughts on how or if AI will affect film and scoring? Yeah, I mean, I have no idea. It's, it's um, pretty amazing what the AI can do, but... Uh, you know, my feeling is that maybe it'll be able to do something sort of generic sounding, I, but be uh, totally innovative. I mean, I, for instance, um, you know, we spend a lot of time just creating our own sounds from acoustical sources and... Um, You know whether it can represent that stuff. Maybe, um, yeah. I I don't know. It's a good. It's a good question. Maybe we'll all be out of a job here next year. <laughs> kind of. I kind of doubt you ever will be, Marco. Um, now I've got a question from Dale. Uh, you go above and beyond designing sound palettes in your scores. Instruments made from organic on location sources like cactus needles, bovine jaw bones to giant aeolian harp style wind piano. Any recent experience experiments you'd uh, care to share? Um, what did we do recently? Um, 
Yeah, we're always doing stuff. Um, what do we do for Renfield? Um, I think that was probably a little more straight ahead. Um, on this upcoming movie that we're doing called The Nun, I mean, we're, we took um, a recorder uh, and different sizes of recorders and um, uh, played with the tuning of them by, you know, pitching them uh, electronically and um, barrel speeding them and uh, it, it's a good source because it's a very pure, almost sine wave like tone, and there's a lot you can do with it. Uh, and that becomes one of the sources that we're using, um, as well as some experiments with just the human voice. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's like a never ending process here. Just just whatever we're working with. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, now in Renfield, I mean, it, it's really, really funny. But then there, then you, there's parts where you really don't laugh at it anymore. I mean, obviously the the whole sequence where he wipes the floor with the Encounter Group. But when you're doing a movie like this, and and again, you kind of realize there's an emotional shift where you kind of really have to get you know some genuine emotion going on. Where where was that shift here for you? Where okay, this is not really funny anymore. Now it's going to be funny again, but here we, we have to be serious. Well, I mean, that place when he kills everybody in the Coda meeting, it, even though with the fake blood and all that, it, it's, um, you know, he's killing all these people, and that becomes a real low point for Renfield after that, uh, when he realizes that ultimately he was responsible for this. Uh, and... Um, I think that's the first place we have, we play his theme sort of in a more serious manner, uh, almost like a dirge. And um, yeah, it shifts gears again in the next, in the next scene when, when, the, uh, when he and Aquafina have to flee the cops, but but there is definitely a, a pause where it's a um, musical low. Yeah, I mean, I and again, I really love Aquafina's character in this. And, and actually, get, again, one of my favorite sequences musically and in the film is the whole SWAT team raid. Uh, talk about scoring that. Yeah, that was fun. So one of the original thoughts, I, again, besides the um, uh, the uh, Swan Lake idea was that when I, when I read the script early on, these scenes, like the SWAT team raid and all that, it almost reminded me of like um, a scene from a movie that Lalo Schifrin would have scored. And uh, when I, the first meeting I had, um, I, I mentioned this, um, this idea and uh, yeah, I mean, it, uh, that was something that we thought would be fun to to actually try. Uh, it, it it was tough because again, you couldn't go too much in one direction because it it skewed the the, the story. It had to be all within the a little bit within the world of what we were doing, but you can still hear there's bongos in there and some flute stuff and uh it gives it a little bit of a a period flavor to it um and you know chris really responded to this stuff uh which was fun it made it it made it fun his encouragement made it fun to to, to play around with that and um keep it a, a fun action scene now, I want to go back into your past with Nicholas Holt uh, for Warm Bodies. I absolutely love that film. And when you look at it, that was kind of one of the really 
interesting zombie films with a difference. Uh, it, like, what if zombies could be good? You know, again, it was a zombie film that you had never seen before in this kind of mass of zombie films and scores. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a really unique take. Uh, the um, the uh, director on it, oh, shoot, I'm so bad with you. Yeah. Um, uh, refresh my memory. Dan. No, I'm at IMDb. <laughs> yeah. Hold on, IMDbing right now to to get this. Jonathan, story. Jonathan Levine. I mean, we did nine perfect strangers yeah. together, which which was um, which was um, again another original, totally original idea that he did. Um, and uh, I think that's what's great about working with him is because he's he's really pushing an, an envelope of doing something new. Um, and in this movie, we got to do that as well. And musically, we got to play around with ideas. Um, you know, we, the initial idea that we had for that was, um, he almost seemed to, to me to be like, you know, at the end of a record when you, it's just going around and you hear the, the, the static and it's skipping. Um, I get at, at, on a LP uh, when you used to play them and you come to the end of a side, for instance. So uh, we thought, oh, maybe we can use this sort of off kilter rhythm that you hear, take that and make that become like uh, a rhythm for his character. Um, so, I mean, again, being inspired by what we saw, saw in the picture to come up with, um, different musical ideas. Yeah, I'd love to, t I think, you know, for me, one of my favorite collaborations of yours is with, uh, Alex Prioris. Uh, again, you know, knowing to me is an, a masterpiece. I robots, a lot of fun. I absolutely love gods of Egypt. Uh, Tell me about that partnership. I, I'd love to see him uh, return and make another movie. Yeah, I know he's experimenting. He has his own visual effects studio down in Australia. I know he's working on some things. Uh, he's, I saw he's posted some shorts and all that. But um, I think sort of in the realm of experimentation, he's truly a creative genius. And um, uh, I, I, too, I, I, I'd love to see him make another movie uh i have a lot of fun getting inspiration from him and his material and i think we work well together <clears throat> we've done uh i want to say three movies together um i robot and um the knowing and god's egypt uh, and yeah, I think those experiences are some of my, my fondest. I, I, I feel like, um, um, he pushes me to do innovative scoring. Yeah. You know, and again, you know, one thing that really stands out to me about your work, you know, particularly in Renfield is that you really essentially kind of go for the jugular when it comes to these big brassy, ballsy, um, you know, ro robust, um, you know, uh, orchestral scores. Um, do you think that's something that's missing? I mean, do you, you know, like this kind of unabashed melody? Uh, is it something you'd like to see more of or hear more of when you go to the movies? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, the way I respond to a picture is, is, is my way of doing it. I don't, I don't know if everybody needs to do the same thing. Um, I, you know, I guess I'm a little bit like Nicholas Cage in that sense. I, I, I'd like to, you know, go for it. Um, and not every movie supports that. So you can't always do it. Some are much more subdued. So, uh, you have to be judicious about it, but. A movie like Renfield, it, it, it holds up and it's almost calling out for being a little bit over the top. 
What are, what are some of your favorite horror comedy scores? I mean, obviously, you know, when you look at Dracula, you've got Love at First Spite, you know, uh, the Leslie Nielsen film. I mean, when you were kind of growing up, were you hit by any kind of horror comedy scores or the kind of mixing of two genres? Not really. Uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I really don't know if I... I mean, I haven't seen Love at First Bite. I, um, name another one. Oh my goodness! No, no, I'm gonna come off like a goof. <laughs> Dracula Dead and Loving It was the was the uh, Leslie uh, Nielsen one. Okay, no, I haven't seen that either. <laughs> I uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I must have seen some, but I I um, nothing's jumping out at me right now. Um, and I'll, Dale reminds me of one spitting with Jim Carrey. I mean, if you're in the eighties, you would have had to have seen one spitting. <laughs> No, I just, either. just that one um you know what, what's cool again you've gotten uh two oscar nominations uh you know for 310 to yuma and then with buck sanders for the hurt locker what was that experience like you know just the whole oscar ride as as it were you know especially with hurt locker which is such an unusual atmospheric and tonal score yeah i mean that was that was sort of um unexpected at the time i you know there was a, a little movie that uh Catherine made and it, it, it the, the acclaim that it received was uh fantastic but we didn't really i don't know if anybody really expected it um the um the experience it's it's fun I, it, the whole whole thing it, it, it's sort of very time consuming because uh you know, the whole lead up is, is your days are so full. I mean, I'm here working at the studio, but then, and it's far away, far away from town, but there's always different events that you have to go to in town. Um, publicity things and um, parties and stuff that, you know, it's fun to do, but I'm not great at, at changing hats. Uh, you know, I'm working in the studio. It's hard to get up and go out and do stuff. So, um, you know, I, uh, I don't know. It's, um, it's, it's fun, but it can be pretty tiring too. Now you mentioned your studio. It, it might be one of the more isolated, coolly isolated studios um, I've been to. What's it like just kind of essentially being in the middle of nowhere? Does it help you create creatively, I guess? Well, I like being in the middle of nowhere. It's, um, it's uh, a good place for me to think. Uh, I don't like a lot of distractions. I get easily sidetracked and uh, can lose my focus. So it's um, it's good for me. And honestly, during COVID time, when I didn't have to go to meetings, everything was on Zoom. Um, I I liked it because I it was like I didn't have to leave. So. Um, now it's, I mean, this is good. I like doing this kind of meeting because it's, it's on Zoom. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I sort of work in a, in a, you know, black box here. Now, um, you know, you've done some really terrific European scores. Again, a lot of movies that people here may not even know, like, you know, you did a German miniseries. You, you did a terrific uh, two-part uh, crime movie called Messrine. Um, and this brings us to another question from Veronica. Is there any big difference in working with American versus European or other nationalities directors? Well, there is a difference in that, uh, at least with the, the French movies that I work with, um, that the whole system, the studio system of movies is set up differently. So that, um, uh, like working with Jean-Francois Richet, uh, and Bertrand Tavernier. Um, their cut is the final cut. You, you're, not, you're not taking studio notes. You're not having any meetings with studio people. Um, you're just working for the director. And, and so in that, in, in that sense, it makes much more um, efficient, I think, and collaborative, uh, which I really like it, it's uh it's um i think a rewarding way to work uh sometimes when you have too many cooks in the kitchen things get watered down a little bit and ideas become 
uh, you're sort of working a little bit to the the um, you know, the what's least offensive or the lowest common denominator in a sense. So, um, uh, I mean, there are advantages to to the American system as well. I think um, uh, like keeping a, a movie tight and um, not getting a little bit, you know. Um, lost sometimes. Uh, not that the, the not that that's ha happened at all with um, Jean Francois, um, but you know some European movies. I feel like that they could use you know another eyes looking at the edit sometimes. But um, uh, but yeah, there's definitely there's definitely. Uh, pros to to working with uh, European projects. Now, I remember when I, we last saw each other in person, uh, you were working on Venom uh, Two, which I thought was a lot of fun. And now they, you know, we're going to get the third one. Um, but you know, that was kind of like knee deep in the whole pandemic. But do, in a way, do you think that the the film scoring uh, part of it has come through? It. I mean, have do you sense now a return to normalcy? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. When we did Renfield, everyone had to get tested for COVID and all, but I think it's pretty much um, back to, well, you know, 95% back to normal. So so obviously you've got the sequel to The Nun coming up. Uh, what else can we expect? Uh, yeah, shoot. I have to go here in a minute. Um, yeah. The, um, uh, yeah, so the sequel to The Nun and... Uh, I guess the next in the John Wick uh, series, uh, it's called Ballerina with, um, I'm doing it with a, a co-score uh, with Anna Drubich, uh, who worked on the third Fear Street movie with me. And, um, um, and, um, and another movie, <laughs> uh, I, sorry, my, my brain. I, I <laughs> I, no worries. I, I, I can sense your master. Last, last, last night, I had a late, a late flight um, back from Texas, and um, I was out for the uh, this motorcycle race out there, and um, uh, the plane got change so i'm supposed to come back at 7 p.m i didn't get back till 12 30 at night and it's been a hectic morning so you ride motorcycles well i was going i did a, a new theme song for um it's uh, the moto gp it's sort of like the formula one of motorcycle racing and they had their american race they have 21 races but there's one in the united states and that's uh it was in austin uh, so I went after that. It's a lot of fun. Well, again, one of your many talents, man. And I will sign off, but I just want to, again, congratulate you on Renfield. I absolutely love this film. Go see it. It's a terrific score. Marco, thank you so much for joining us at Film Music Live. Renfield is now in theaters with Marco Beltrami's score on Backlot Music. A big thanks to Backlot's Kenya, Nikki Walsh, and our show's producer, Dale Turner, Mark Northam, and Mark Banning, and composer Buck Sanders. And I'll be seeing you on the next Film Music Live Monday, April 24th at 1 p.m as we team up with the Picard composers, Stephen Barton and Frederick Weidman. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, pleasure, Dan. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, see you soon. See you soon, Marco. Thank you. Bye.